नमस्कार अ वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन आकाशवाणी दिस इज अभिनीत शुक्ला ब्रिंगिंग लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शेल ब्रिंग टू यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस Prime Minister Narendra Modi says India a ray of hope for the world when it comes to strengthening economy and battling poverty. India to generate 65% of its total power from non-fossil fuels by 2030. Sri Lanka's power minister submits proposal for slashing electricity tariff as Lankan rupee rebounds. Iran claims successful test launch of ballistic missile with range up to 2000 km. Chinese hackers spying on US critical infrastructure. says joint report by microsoft and western intelligence agencies in japan three dead including two police officers following rare shooting and stabbing attack tributes poured in for after legendary rock and roll singer tina turner dies and in sports indian shuttlers pv sindhu kidambi shrikant and hs pranoy sail into quarter finals of malaysia masters in kuala lumpur Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Thursday said India is being watched with great hope by the world today. He said India has remarkably progressed in strengthening the economy, battling poverty and combating the COVID-19 pandemic. The Prime Minister said people of the world want to come to India to see India to understand the essence of India and in such a situation there are excellent opportunities for the country. Mr Modi's remarks came after he returned from a three nation trip of Japan, Papua New Guinea and Australia. The prime minister said India is unstoppable now. He said it is and will continue to advance at a rapid pace. Aaj pura vishwa Bharat ko bahut ummeedon se dekh raha hai. Hum Bharat ke logon ne jis tarah apni arthavyavastha ko majbooti di hai. जिस तरह हम गरीबी से लड़ रहे हैं उसने पूरी दुनिया का विश्वास जगा दिया है जिस कोरोना से लड़ने में बड़े बड़े देश पस्त हो गए उसी कोरोना को हम भारतीयों ने मिलकर के कड़ाई से टक्कर भी दी हमने दुनिया का सबसे बड़ा वैक्सीनेशन अभियान चलाया addressing people after flagging off the inaugural run of state of the art vande bharat express connecting national capital delhi to dehradun in the himalayan state of uttarakhand prime minister modi said the enhanced connectivity option will help the state take full advantage of the future opportunities the introduction of the vande bharat train will herald a new era of comfortable travel experience especially for the tourists traveling to the state the train has been indigenously built and is equipped with advanced safety features including the indigenous anti collision technology the prime minister said uttarakhand will become the center of attraction for the spiritual consciousness of the whole world in the coming days and state's development should be as per future demands india's science and technology minister dr jitendra singh said that international cooperation will play a key role in achieving the country's net zero emissions target by the year 2070 he stressed that it is the collective responsibility of all to work together for a more secure and sustainable future he was speaking during the website and logo launch event of the joint 8th mission innovation ministerial mi8 and 14th clean energy ministerial that is cem14 in new delhi india will host the mi8 jointly with cem14 in july this year alongside the G20 energy transition ministerial meeting in Goa India will have 65% of its power generation capacity from non-fossil fuels by 2030 addressing the confederation of indian industry annual session in new delhi india's power minister rk singh said that country's per capita energy consumption and per capita carbon emission are one of the lowest in the world He said net zero is important but what is more important is that there is a need to provide enough electricity to make sure that the country does not run short of electricity when one wants to set up an industry He added that it is non negotiable He asserted there will be no compromise on ensuring round the clock energy supply even though it is a challenge The minister said the addition of capacity is a challenge 
but also an opportunity because India is one of the fastest growing countries with one of the largest energy demands. Mr. Singh also said, the government is giving a huge push to hydro energy. Mr. Singh said, India has launched the National Green Hydrogen Mission because the country believes in the environment. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on India's commitment to clean energy transition. In conversation are Mukul Sanwal, environmentalist, and S. Rangabhasham, Akashwani correspondent. To start off with the commitment of 65% of our power generation from non-fossil fuel by the year 2030, so just a matter of seven more years, how achievable is it? See, when we look at these figures, one must look at it in their context. The most important context is that India, unlike other developed countries or even many other countries which are not of this size or population, is still spreading modern energy throughout the country. In our remote villages and among the poor, even the cities, they do, do not have access to modern energy. By modern energy, I mean electricity for lighting, gas for cooking, and some kind of basic transport facilities and housing. Now the question is that why do we need energy? We need energy because energy is not electricity. Energy is not just transportation, but energy is also steel, cement and infrastructure. Steel and cement need huge quantities of energy in their processing. So when we talk of urbanization, when we talk of middle class living, it is not just the financial aspect that is important, it is also an energy aspect that is important because all that is not possible without extending modern energy to these people. You cannot achieve middle class status without modern energy because you will not have a modern house, you will not have infrastructure, you will not have cities, not have transport, and you will not have basic amenities like refrigerator. The concept of replacing a lantern with a bulb is not about middle class levels of living. This is not what the country is aspiring to. So the question then comes is that how do we generate this kind of energy while keeping within our commitments? of having a certain percentage from non-fossil fuel sources. Please remember that the country's commitment is not to reduce energy or to eliminate coal, but to have a certain percentage from non-fuel sources. Now, we know that the energy requirement is going to increase tremendously. For example, today the average Indian uses one-tenth the energy of the average American in the United States. We are not going to achieve that high level because they waste a lot of energy, but we will still use much more energy to have a comparable or comfortable middle class level of living. Now, where will that come from? Today, one two-thirds is coming from fossil fuels, which includes gas and coal primarily, or electricity generation. Now, the non-fossil fuel already shifted to about 43%, if we took at the total at this stage. Because fossil fuel has come down from two-thirds, coal has come down from two-thirds to about 55-57%. So what is happening is, and I think this is important, it is not that we can look at one figure in isolation. When we look at the energy requirement as a whole, we see that the requirement is increasing. That increasing requirement will continue to be met by coal, but the percentage share of coal will continue to decline because the share of non-fossil energy is going to increase more rapidly than the increase in the coal generation. I think this is important to understand that as the pie gets bigger, each slice is also going to get bigger, but the slice that constitutes renewable energy will have a larger size than the slice of the fossil fuel energy. So we will maintain the percentage that we have committed to. Now in this, the important issue is that we are also going in for new technology at the same time. It is not just solar and wind, which the Europeans used or other countries used in a big manner. China, United States, Europe and other countries. We are also getting into green hydrogen, which is the non-fossil fuel of the future. And there it needs more technology. It is basically technology driven, electrolyzing hydrogen from water. Yeah. It releases a lot of heat which can be used for steel, cement, fertilizer, as well as chemical plants. So it has wider benefits than just the generation of green hydrogen. Right. Mr. Sanwal, uh, we are talking about, you know, switching over from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuel. It includes, you know, hydroelectricity, solar, wind, green hydrogen, nuclear. But all these, I'm sure you'll agree, are really capital intensive and have long gestation periods. 
in a country like ours where we have you know given subsidies on electricity consumption many of the state governments give free electricity to farmers don't you think this entire question of affordability would really be a challenging one not only from the individual perspective but also from the state governments or the electricity boards perspective you see there again as i said we have to see this in the context of the spread of modern energy in india you are right take the case of the the subsidies to the farmers it's a huge burden on the state electricity boards but then when we are looking at modern energy in a different sense we find that a solar energy panel can power the pumps for individual farmers and it is happening they don't need to be connected to the grid for pumping water and it does not cost anything there is an initial subsidy but that subsidy is less than the subsidy and the electricity losses that are in long transmission line this is just an example the same thing is happening in the urban areas where solar rooftop panels are spreading gradually but now the technology has matured and one can hope to see a faster spread yeah. and the same principle but the question then comes is that at the one end we have to ensure that the price paid by the consumer is reasonable or comparable with cheapest electricity source that is coal now for doing that we need to make sure that the technology that we use because this is technology intensive coal has to be mined but solar wind and even hydro to an extent is all technology intensive so the question comes is how do we reduce the cost of production to keep the cost to the consumer low and this is where i think the prime minister has given a clearer direction a very clearer direction that today most of these equipments are imported from abroad the challenge he has put before the ministries is that you give an initial subsidy get that production here and because we have such scale such mass production the price will come down and when the price comes down the price to the consumer will go down so i think the vision of the prime minister is very clear yeah. we have to move in this direction yeah. we have to keep the cost low for the consumer let us start producing inside yeah mr sanwal let's also talk about financing you know which is a major stumbling block as i said earlier also you know these uh, initiatives whether it is solar or wind or green hydrogen they are all capital intensive don't you think you know financing is a major stumbling block and there needs to be some innovative model like maybe creation of a special purpose vehicle or a joint venture or some other mechanism so that there is no dearth of financing or finances for the energy sector you see here the government is taking certain very innovative steps which don't look innovative because they are not modeled on the west so far we have been copying the west but we realize that our conditions are different our situation is different the scale here is different so we need to develop our own models now i find that the national thermal power corporation ntpc which is having huge profits coal india having huge profits is shifting to renewable energy so i think the innovation of the prime minister is that this is not about companies producing coal or a company is uh, producing coal fired plants and selling electricity they are all energy companies so if they have profit in one part if they can invest it in the development of renewable energy because all these public sector concerns had huge capital reserves which were not being deployed because they were not able to spend them in the traditional means of expenditure and now you have new elements coming up so as soon as production starts in the country where the private sector who are into energy they are all going into this production of solar panels silicon vapors semiconductors other material that is required for solar energy yeah so here you have a very nice mix it is a different kind of mix to the traditional public private partnership we were used to in the past of public sector companies who are capital rich in the sense who have good reserves and can branch off from what they were doing into the related field of renewable energy and similarly the private sector sees a demand so they get into production So here you see the circle is being completed the public sector has got the capital they are getting into that of these plants where these big solar farms for example because it is easier for them to get the land yeah and the private sector is getting into production of the material that goes into the solar panels because they see an assured demand so it is a different kind of public partnership and different kind of financial packages that is emerging which does needs government to start it off and i think that is the right approach here Yeah. which have not been done in this kind of manner in other countries because they didn't have this combination yeah mr sanwal let's also talk about uh, you know evs or electric vehicles there has been a clear policy push a clear stress on you know changing over from fossil fuel based uh, vehicles to electric vehicles we have seen you know sales cross 1 lakh per month figure as well 
But let me play the devil's advocate here. Critics also point out that, uh, you know, as and when the number of uh, electric vehicles increases in the economy, they will have an adverse impact on the consumption of electricity because they would, at the end of the day, need electricity for recharging. So that would initiate a new sub-segment of, you know, consumption and again have an impact on uh, fossil fuels only because most of our power plants run on coal and uh, gas and others. So, it will again contribute to our carbon footprint. So, it is instead of directly, it is indirectly again doing the same thing. You see, this depends how we look at it. First of all, the West doesn't talk about transportation because one third of their carbon emissions are from transportation. They only talk about production of electricity. But we talk about transportation also and electricity because both are spreading. As urbanization increases, middle class levels of income come up, both are going to increase. And when we look at transportation, the issue for us is not that we have a large number of vehicles powered by the internal combustion engine which needs oil. We are still growing the number of vehicles. And so we have a choice. They don't have that kind of choice, so they don't talk about it. It's a lifestyle issue for them. For us, we have a choice whether we push electric vehicles or we push the usual internal combustion engine with oil. And that choice in our case is dictated primarily by the fact that 80% of our oil is imported. No country wants to be dependent on oil imports. So when we look at the electric consumption for our electricity vehicles, we have to see the import of oil. And we also have to see that, yes, the oil carbon footprint is two times that of coal, but it is still there. So we eliminate that carbon footprint when we get into electricity because 50% of our electricity is going to come from non-fossil fuels down the line. We have already said that that is a trend that is likely to materialize. So 50% of our energy will be electricity that we use will be non-fossil fuel. The oil also has a carbon footprint which is half that of coal. So in balance we will see as far as the nation is concerned, the country is concerned, oil dependence is reduced, prices come down. Because again, as demand goes up, the prices will come down. So I think the model that the government is following, yeah. and it's the direct, clear direction of the Prime Minister, Atmanirbhar Bharat. I think here that concept becomes very, very important. On that uh, optimistic note, uh, let's wind up uh, this discussion. Mr. Mukul Sanwal, thank you so much for joining us in this program. Thank you. You were listening to a discussion on India's commitment to clean energy transition. The participants were Mukul Sanwal, environmentalist, and S. Rangabhasham, Akashwani correspondent. This is Akashwani giving you the world news. G20 Council's second disaster risk reduction working group, DRRWG meeting, concluded in Mumbai on Thursday. With the technical and functional level officials coming to an under- understanding of the importance of disaster resilient infrastructure and financing for disaster risk reduction as the central theme of any discussion on disaster risk reduction. Speaking to Akashwani News, the Member Secretary of the National Disaster Management Authority said that India has received enthusiastic support on all priority areas from the G20 countries. We had the second meeting of the Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group where all the 20 members of G20, a number of guest countries, as well as uh, international organizations uh, participated. We had set out five priorities for this group, early warning for all, resilient infrastructure, financing disaster risk reduction, ecosystem-based approaches to disaster risk reduction, better systems or building back better after disasters. On all the five priorities, we got full support, very enthusiastic support from the G20 countries. We hope to have a specific outcome when we meet for the third meeting in July in Chennai. The second Trade and Investment Working Group meeting under G20, which concluded in Bengaluru on Thursday, held an in-depth discussion on the way forward to integrate MSMEs with global trade, set up a meta-information portal for MSMEs, establish resilient and diversified global value chain, prepare a compendium on mutual recognition agreements, digitize cross-border trade and press for WTO reforms. Briefing the media persons of the conclusion of the Working Group meeting in Bengaluru on Thursday, Commerce Secretary Sunil Bhartwal explained the nuances of the deliberations. Following the announcement of the new visa policy on Wednesday, which seeks to put visa restrictions on people trying to undermine a democratic election in Bangladesh, 
U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh Peter Haas met with the representatives of the ruling Awami League, Opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party BNP and Jatiya Party JP in Dhaka on Thursday. Confirming the meeting, the U.S. Embassy in a tweet said that the U.S. supports free and fair elections. The new visa policy aims to restrict visas to those who undermine the democratic process and it applies to everyone. Sri Lanka's Power and Energy Minister Kanchana Vijasekara has submitted a proposal to revise the electricity tariff to the Parliament. The revision will be effective from July this year. The reduction of tariffs will be a breather to the common man as the island nation had seen sharp increases in power tariffs over the last year. Earlier yesterday, the Parliament had voted on a resolution to remove the Chairman of the Public Utilities Commission, Janak Ratnaike. More from our correspondent. Speaking at the Parliament, Power Minister Kanchana Vijay Sikara said over 17 lakh families will receive the benefits, while families in the lower slabs would receive a minimum of 23% of relief. The move comes as the Lankan rupee had appreciated since its lows in February this year. So far, the rupee has appreciated by over 16% against the dollar, making the imports cheaper. Earlier this month, the power minister had tweeted that the government would revise the power tariff in line with the cost-reflective pricing that is being followed. Further, the slashing of the price will give some respite to the Ranil government after a slew of unpopular reform measures had been implemented over the last one year. The power tariff was raised by 66% in February this year after the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka had approved the proposal to hike the tariff while the chairman had dissented on it. For World News, Ahmed Moin Farooqi, Colombo. Iran on Thursday said that it has successfully test-launched a ballistic missile with a range of around 2,000 km range. The missiles are capable of carrying 1,500 kg of warheads. The state news agency Irna said the liquid fuel missile had been named the Khaybar, a reference to a Jewish castle overrun by Muslim warriors in the early days of Islam. Iran now claims that its weapons can reach the bases of Israel and the United States. Despite opposition from the United States and European countries, Iran has maintained that it will continue to develop its defensive missile program. Three months after the Chinese spy balloon episode, a new report has claimed that cyber hackers backed by the Chinese government have been spying on several critical infrastructures of the United States. The report was released jointly by the Western intelligence agencies and Microsoft. According to the reports, the U.S. infrastructure under Chinese surveillance includes telecommunications, transportation hubs and Guam Island, which is home to strategically important military bases among other installations. The U.S. National Security Agency said it was working with partner nations like Canada, New Zealand, Australia and the U.K. to identify breaches. China, however, refuted the reports. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning termed the hacking allegations as a disinformation campaign by the Western nations. In Japan, three people died, including a woman and two male police officers, in a rare stabbing and shooting incident. The attack was carried out by a man using a hunting rifle in Japan's Nagano Prefecture. The first call that police received was one of a stabbing, and when officials reached the crime scene, the man fired something resembling a hunting rifle, striking four people. The suspect fled the scene and holed himself up at a building in the city. The police spokesman added that its forces are investigating reports of a gunshot-like sound which was heard near the scene hours after the attack. Nagno City Administration urged citizens to stay indoors. Gun violence is extremely rare in Japan, a country of 125 million people. It has one of the lowest rates of gun crimes in the world due to its extremely strict gun control laws. Tributes have been pouring in for legendary singer Tina Turner, who died in Switzerland on Wednesday following a prolonged illness. She was 83 years old. Turner was diagnosed with intestinal cancer in 2016 and received a kidney transplant in 2017. Popular celebrities including Beyonce Knowles Carter, Mariah Carey, Mick Jagger, Brian Adams, Rosario Dawson and Naomi Campbell paid tribute to her. Many politicians including US President Joe Biden and former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton also joined the world in paying tribute to the iconic singer. The domestic benchmark indices ended on a positive note in a highly volatile session. A report from the business desk.
The Sensex appreciated 99 points or 0.16% to finish at 61,873. The Nifty also climbed 36 points or 0.2% to close at 18,321. Asian shares, except Japan's Nikkei, fell two months low as the US dollar rose as the en passe in negotiations to raise the US debt ceiling kept investors wary of risky assets due to the hit the global economy will take if the US government defaults. Hong Kong's Hang Seng plunged 2% and South Korea's Kospi ended half a percent down. Singapore's Straits Times Index slipped 0.2% and China's Shanghai Composite Index declined 0.1%. On the other hand, Japan's Nikkei 225 appreciated 0.4%. In intraday trade, European markets were also down. Oil prices fell after Russian Deputy Prime Minister played down the prospect of further OPEC Plus production cuts. at its meeting next week Brent crude was trading at $76.95 per barrel back home gold prices at the multi commodity exchange for june contracts were trading at 59897 rupees per 10 grams on the other hand silver was trading at 70907 rupees per kilogram for july contracts and in the forex market the rupee closed at 82 rupees and 74 paise against the us dollar s rangabashim for world news Top Indian shuttlers PV Sindhu, Kidambi Srikanth and HS Pranoy sailed into the quarter finals of Malaysia Masters in Kuala Lumpur on Thursday. The two-time Olympic medalist Sindhu defeated Japan's Aya Ohori 21-16-21-11 in the women's singles. Sindhu will lock horns with YM Zhang of China on Friday. In men's singles, Kidambi ousted 8th seed Kunlawot Vedatsan of Thailand 21-19-21-19. while Pranoy overpowered All England Open champion Li Shi Feng of China 13-21, 21-16, 21-11. On Friday, HS Pranoy will be up against Japan's Kei Nishimoto, while Kidambi will take on C. Adinata of Indonesia in the men's singles event. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Wall Street Journal reports, Germany enters recession in blow to Europe's economy. The Guardian writes Rwandan ex-police chief arrested in South Africa over 1994 genocide. Washington Post reports Democrats worry growth over White House approach to debt talks. South China Morning Post writes US and China have irreconcilable differences but there is hope that they can coexist says Singapore's Lawrence Wong. The Globe and Mail writes Amanda Gorman's poem for Biden's inauguration banned by Florida school. The Straits Times reports United Kingdom losing out on tourism's high spenders. Daily Star reports Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina returned to Bangladesh on Thursday morning after wrapping up her 3-day official visit to Qatar. During the visit Sheikh Hasina joined the Qatar Economic Forum met with the Amir at Amiri Diwan held a bilateral meeting with Prime Minister of Qatar Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman bin Jassim Al Thani and another meeting with President of Rwanda Paul Kagame. A quick look at the headlines once again. Prime Minister Narendra Modi says India a ray of hope for the world when it comes to strengthening economy and battling poverty. India to generate 65% of its total power from non-fossil fuels by 2030. Sri Lanka's power minister submits proposal for slashing electricity tariff as Lankan rupee rebounds. Iran claims successful test launch of ballistic missile with range up to 2000 km. Chinese hackers spying on US critical infrastructure says joint report by Microsoft and Western intelligence agencies. In Japan, three dead including two police officers following rear shooting and stabbing attack. Tributes poured in for legendary rock and roll singer Tina Turner. And in sports, Indian shuttlers PV Sindhu, Kidambi Srikanth and HS Pranoy sail into quarter finals of Malaysia Masters in Kuala Lumpur. And now before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan Vaishnav Jan. by artist from italy And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.